Okay. Techno World School is a school for autistic children and young adults, and we have set this podcast up to provide our pupils with a fantastic opportunity to, to develop a range of skills whilst interviewing top sports men and women from a variety of different sports. Joining us today on the TWS Sports Podcast are two cricketers. Our first great guest is the former U Australian captain who has gone down as one of the greatest Australian captains of all time. And our second guest is a former England cricketer who has gone to, on to become the managing director, director of, of England cricket. Welcome to the sports pod, welcome to the podcast, Steve Waugh and Rob Kay. Thank you. It's Hello. great to be here. Good to have you guys here. Thank you. First of all, we'd like to thank you so much, so much to you both for joining us today. We really appreciate it. With the with the Ashes starting this week, we wanted to bring you both together to talk about your Ashes memories and look ahead to the series. Good idea. Okay. <laughs> what would you like to know? <laughs> okay. Okay. Is it right when you both for Kent played for Kent, Rob, you were in charge of getting the flat ready for Steve? <laughs> yeah, you didn't do a very good job there, did you, Casey? <laughs> you, you've got good researchers. I, I, you've got the yeah. best researchers of anyone that I've come across, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, our Google search engine isn't called Google, it's called Adam. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so yeah. I was only young. When? What year was that? That would have been two thousand and two, maybe. Yeah, two thousand and two. I reckon. Yeah, yeah, twenty years ago. Yeah, cool. I feel old now. Anyway, so Wouldn't it's that be three weird... years ago. Two thousand and two. Oh, ow! Twenty-one years. 21 years yeah. <laughs> before you were Me? probably before you were born. Anyway, so. So we we were halfway through the year and we had a really good friend of mine was the was the other was the overseas player before um, Steve came over. And that was Andrew Simons, who was 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 such a good bloke. And unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. And he and I, because we were young, we used to go out a lot and they were swapping flats because he was the overseas player before he had the flat that we were then going to give or Kent were going to then give. Uh, when Steve came over, so we were met. We sort of planned to have, to just get it really clean and you know really make it look immaculate because he's captain of Australia. Simo wants to, he's in and around the Australian team, and you know so he wants to impress. Anyway, we sort of snuck out for a couple of drinks, which turned into about twenty, and then we ended up having a party back at this flat. And there must have been about 15 people. I actually didn't stay there that night. And sort of in the morning, and I wasn't there, but when he turned up, there were mates of mine who loved their cricket, but they didn't know. You know, they didn't know what was coming. Yeah. They were just hockey players and all of this. And as he as one of my mates has come out really hung over, there's like the chief exec. Steve Ward, the Australian captain, and my mates come out in just his pants, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and Simo's like, Tugger, Benny, Benny, Tugger. And, and that was it. And the Kent community oh. did, not find, did not find it funny at all. Oh, it like, no! Like it, it, it was very relaxing. I didn't worry me too much because I'm pretty messy anyway. So, but, so the room was, yeah, it was, probably had a bit of work to be done, but I thought, okay, it's a nice relaxed walk. I mean, here we go. We're playing for Kent, so... It didn't matter too much, but yeah, it was um, probably wasn't uh, the cleanest when I turned up. But then again, I'm not the cleanest myself, so I was well, okay with it. A <laughs> uh, a drunk guy came out in his underwear. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that's I that's doubt it's very it, clean. It? <laughs> that was super. No, he's trying to make me feel welcome. Australians like a drink as well, so it was okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We want to take you both back to your earliest memories of sports from Assetches. Steve, we'll start with you You first. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a certain Ashes memory from your childhood that you remember? Yeah, look, I used to love watching the Ashes from Australia. I'd get up uh, early in the morning and watch the test matches and listen to the, the commentary on BBC and um, you know people like John Arlott and all these famous commentators. And the Ashes was the ultimate for cricket in Australia and um, to watch England play Australia was special. 
Um, yeah, so but my first real memory was watching a guy called Doug Walters, who was a great Australian all-rounder. And it was a test match in Perth. And he was 97 not out in the last ball. And Bob Willis was coming in the bowl, a really quick bowler, fantastic bowler for England. And he bounced Doug Walters and he hooked him straight off his nose and went for six. And I thought, how great is that? He had six off the last ball. He's 100 not out. The crowd were going crazy. And he just walked off the field nice and relaxed and um, and scored this incredible century. So for me, in the back of my mind, I thought, gee, that'd be fantastic one day to maybe hit a four or six off the last ball and get 100. And uh, 20, or, 20 or 30 years later, it actually happened to me at the SCG. So it was, it was one of those things where I watched it as a young kid and it was a dream and it came true. So for me, the Ashes were special. We played these imaginary test matches in the backyard. I had three brothers and it was always Australia versus England. So we tossed the bat up in the air and whichever way it came down, either hills or valleys, whoever lost the toss had to be England and whoever won the toss was Australia. So we had these um, backyard battles where it was Australia versus England. <laughs> Rob, what's your earliest memories of sport? Of Ashes. Of Ashes. Well, the Ashes, funny enough, was actually when he was playing, probably in 1989, I'd say. Were you right? Was yeah. that when? Yeah, 89 was, yeah, the, the big series for us, yeah. And, and my memory of Ashes cricket really was Australia winning all the time. And I remember Steve batting when I, what would I have been, 10, 11? And he always said, like, I, I can, all I can remember is I was never really getting him out. And the same, there's Dave, I think David Boone, people like that. Yeah. And I remember you batting in chewing. Well, you always had chewing gum on. Yeah, like, yeah, like a chewing gum. Chewing and when gum, you, yeah. you know, we could never get you out, and yet you were having chewing gum, which I probably wasn't allowed as a kid. I just thought that was the coolest. That was like the coolest yeah. thing. Ever. Yeah. So that's my man. And then it just sort of went on, and every because you always, I always had more things. I always respected more probably in sports, men and women was ones who did it when it was really tough, and that's what he did. So whenever his side were in trouble, that's when Steve Waugh would get some runs, and he never looked like he was ever going to take a backward step. And that was sort of my first sort of memories, really, of cricket, because that would have been on the BBC, probably, something like that, yeah. and you can watch all sure. of it. Yeah. I remember, did Neil Mallander play a game at one stage? Or uh, something? Well, no, he, yeah, he might have played a test, but I played with him at Somerset, so he was a good mate of mine. But you make me feel old, mate, saying that you watch me as a kid. I mean, <laughs> I thought we were the same age, but you must be 20 years younger, are you? I know, exactly. How old are you, Casey? I'm, I think I'm 44. It's my birthday the other day, but I'm actually... Bring new chicken. I, I just turned 58, so yeah. <laughs> Feeling old. But but in this new job... How old are you, how old are you uh, Lisa and Jacob? How old are you guys? Oh, I'm 16. I'm 14. Yeah. Jacob, 14. Yeah, 14? Yep. Good. So what year of school are you guys in? Um, I'm in the sixth form. Oh. Um, I'm in the hub in Horizon. So the lower sixth form, yeah? Yeah. Okay, very good. All right, so you're the same age as my son. He's 14, you see, as well. He's, do, he, he's just slept in because it's so hot over here. And my wife went out to walk the dogs and I've let him sleep in. So she's had to take him to school and she's not best impressed with me. <laughs> yeah, something tells me you'll be in the doghouse tonight. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a place I know well. <laughs> Steve, that Australian team in the 19s and the early 2000s was such a good, good team. What made the team so strong? Um, yeah, it was, it was a good team, um, but we had a lot of experience in our team. So the guys have been around a long time. It was a, the average age of the team, I think, was 31. So it was a pretty old side. So we were pretty um, relaxed and comfortable and, um, and the guys knew their game really well. We got on well as a team. We were good friends um, and we had a lot of talent. I mean, there were some amazing players in those teams. Um, we look at Shane Warne and Glenn McGrath and Matthew Hayden and Ricky Ponning and Adam Gilchrist, so we had these, and Mark Wall, we had these incredible players. So, And we were very ambitious. We wanted to be the best side in the world and we wanted to um, keep playing better and better and set a standard that um, that was hard to follow for the other side. So we were you know, ambitious. We tried to score runs really quickly, not as quickly as the current England side, but back then it was, you know, to score 300 runs in a day was seem, seemed a lot. Now it's, I think it's about 450 or 500 these days, but... Um, so we, we tried to um, do things a little bit differently. Um, we wanted to always improve. We were never complacent. And we wanted to be one of the, the great Australian sides. So we um, 
we enjoyed each other's company and we had good fun as well. And we had plenty of good times. So I think that was the key to our success, actually enjoying each other's company, but, but playing some really good cricket. Hmm. Rob, you played in the played in the 2002 and 2003 Ashes series in Australia. How did it feel for you to be called up and know your play in the Ashes in Ashes series? Well, if, you, if you're a cricketer, probably if you're English or Australian, that's like the World Cup. That's the biggest thing that you could do, especially back then. Now it might be a bit different. Well, it probably isn't, actually, because there's so many other games, other formats. So I would have been 22, something like that. And it was like, oh, this is, you know, it's everything you dreamed of, really. Um, and, and it was against probably the, one of the best teams that's ever lived. And you you sort of remember because you've sort of watched a lot of these play you, when you when you play as a youngster for your country, it, it wasn't sort of five or six years ago before that you were watching a lot of these guys on telly. So it's like it's quite surreal when you're playing against them. And so to go out there and do it in Australia, and look, we got hammered. But it, it I, I don't think there's a, so much of what I think about the game and what I've done in life since has been shaped by those experiences when you were younger. So as, as much as we found it really hard, I think I loved every single second of it. I'm not sure everyone in the team did. Like the older guys, they, they'd sort of, the generation before, they, they'd sort of been bruised and battered by Australia. Yeah. But myself, Steve Harmison, my other friend, we just thought how, you know, we just sort of loved every single second of it. And every, and I remember coming back to Ken and everything you're doing is trying to emulate what the best players did. So I was very grateful to go on that trip. Hmm. Steve, you were captain. You were captain. Captain. Captained Australia yeah. for two Ashes series and won them both. Did you ever get bored of beating <laughs> England so much? <laughs> well, I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, it might be that one. Yeah, no, look, um, you never take it for granted, Test match cricket. It's tough. And, um, Whilst we had a good record against England, we always thought they were a really good side. But for some reason, we seem to have um, the advantage over them for a few Ashes series. And um, but I would never have thought my last Ashes series in two thousand one England was um, would be the last time we've actually won in England. So it's been twenty two years since we've won the Ashes in England. And when I finished up, I thought, okay, that's great. Uh, whoever's the next captain will go to England, and we'll continue that bit of a tradition. But um, you know, so you see how cricket goes in cycles, and you've got to make the most of it when you're playing well because. You never know when you, uh, your winning run's going to stop. But for me, we had um, we had a really good side. We enjoyed cricket. A lot, a lot of us have played a lot in England. I played, um, you know, league cricket up the north of England. I played county cricket for Somerset and Kent. I played on an SO scholarship for Essex. So I played a lot of cricket. Felt really comfortable in, in England. I love the conditions, love the crowds, and um, maybe yeah, not the just... weather. <laughs> yeah, well, funny you say that. Um, I think we only had one really wet Ashes series. So a lot of the time it was pretty good and. You know, um, so, yeah, it's um, a bit surprising because everyone says, oh, the English summer is terrible, but I always find it fantastic. I love how the sun's out till about 10 o'clock at night. And, you know, it's um, for me, it was um, my favourite place to play. And um, a lot of the guys said the same. And um, as I say, we just, um, we really enjoy playing cricket in England. We we're lucky we had a great side. And when you're winning, it's it's always much more fun. Believe us, right now, the temperature here would remind you of Australia over there. <laughs> that right. What's the temperature there now? Uh, it's about 28 degrees today. 28. Well, and our bodies are not 20. made for that temperature. They're not. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we'd have, a, we'd have two jumpers on if it's 28. <laughs> Chilly for us. What? Yeah, Where are you guys? Cool, isn't it? <laughs> Rob, what made... Uh, uh, no. Right, this is still a question from... Rob, if you could have one Australian player that you have played against and put them in the current... English England team, who would it be and why? That's a very good question. Who do you feel like you, if you could, you would drag from Australia and bring them over here? I don't mind because you don't have to say me, mate. You could say something. To be honest, there'd be so many, but the best by a mile, the one that no one else, the thing, the one, the person who could do what nobody else could in the world was Shane Warne. You know, he, he was the guy that could, you know, as a leg spinner, you know, you got to remember, like before then, leg spin was like a dying art, and then he he brought it back and he made it cool. 
And actually, so much of, you know, the mentality and everything that we've tried to do with England has come from the way that he did things, the way that Steve did things, you know. And, and so he sort of epitomised what we're trying to do now, really. Um, so he would be the person that if you could have one, and for all those great players they had, if you could have one, you'd have Shane one. All right. Steve. If you could have one England player that you oh, that you have played against and bring them over to the current Australian team, who would it be? That's a really good question. Uh, and Basically, we're just I mean, flipping the, the script. Yeah, there's a couple of players now in the current side I'd like to have in my team, um, but I didn't play against them. Someone like Ben Stokes, I'd, I'd like him to play for Australia. Um, the players I've played against, well, there were some really fantastic cricketers. I mean, Alex Stewart and... Um, it was an amazing cricketer. I mean, I think Andy Caddick was the one that could have been the great player, which, you know, he didn't quite reach his potential. But I think, you know, he could have been as good as anyone. Um, Darren Goff was a great player. Um, gee, that's a really tough. Graham Thorpe was a fantastic batsman. So um, I think Graham Thorpe probably, as a batsman, would fit into the Australian side of playing pretty well because he was pretty hard-nosed. Um, he liked a good battle. Uh, he tended to score runs in tough situations. So I think if I had to pick a batsman, I'd, I'd pick Graham Thorpe. Rob, we spoke to you last year on the podcast, and since then you have you've you have had a promotion. Before we start talking about this Ashes series, can you just talk to us about what the role as of managing director of England cricket came about? So I was probably a commentator when I spoke to you guys last time. Yes, you were. And as a commentator, you you basically, when something's good, you say it's good. When something's bad, you say it's bad. And, and then you just move on and you forget about it. Mm. And, and then if I wasn't doing that, I was probably playing golf, which was, you know, I had the easiest life ever, really. And then it, after England lost the Ashes last year in Australia, the, the managing director got sacked and the coach got sacked and the captain stood down. And they needed someone else to do it. So I then came, I got asked to become the managing director. And my job was then to appoint the coach, the captain. And then what, what we wanted to do really was sort of change the mentality of English cricket a little bit. So that's sort of been the mission that we've had since what la this time last year, almost a year and a couple of months, I'd say. Hmm. Hey, Gunk, can you tell us, tell us a bit more about how it's all happened and what you're going to do in the current Ashes series so I can pass well, on to the team? Well, so so then we got in... Great. I mean, I mean, you've done amazingly well. It's been great to watch. I've I got to admit, it's, um, I think Test cricket needs what England have done over the last couple of years. They need excitement, I think, with one-day cricket taking over. We need to get people back watching Test match cricket, so England's definitely led the way, and this current Ashes series is going to be pretty amazing to watch, I think. Yeah, I, and that's the thing. So, like, I always think what you... so. I wanted someone who sort of thought like me and a little bit, but had done, had more credibility. So Brendan McCullum came in, who was captain of New Zealand. And he, I thought, had sort of transformed the way New Zealand played their test cricket. And in England, I think we have this, we have, this, and it's not just a cricket thing. I think we have this, our culture, and it was the same in the 90s more than ever. Our culture, we, we look at, we see all the trouble rather than all the opportunity. And you wanted people that just saw the opportunity with English cricket. And Brendan McCullum was there. He sort of spoke about, you know, he wanted players to look, you know, to look to put bowlers under pressure, to be able to soak up pressure as well. But he wanted people to go out there and maximise their potential and play a style of cricket that actually would make Test cricket relevant again because it's the best format. You know, none of the great players that I've seen with great players because they did it in T20. Only the, the great players, only you're only a great player if you've done it in test cricket. Mm -hmm. And so we then got Ben Stokes to come in as well, who's very similar. He's like 10 levels above how we think really because he is ultra positive in everything that he does. But it's not just the way that he plays, it's the way that he lives their li his life. You know, most, most English people, I think, we always sort of spot all the problems. We've got a problem for every solution. Whereas these guys have solutions for every problem or try to, and that's the way to be. I got a question for you, um, Keezy. Someone like Graham Hick, how would he go in the current current setup? 
Yeah, I often think about that. You see, we we sort of try. You try and pick the most talented players, and then let them get out of their way a little bit, and not not tell them, you know, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, we used to speak. You know, Shane Warne, you oh, be careful of his leg spinner. Be careful of this one, Glenn McGrath. You know, yeah. God, he's a great player. Watch out for this. Watch out for that. Whereas we're a bit more like, I don't know, go and you know, you know where he's going to bowl it. Try and hit him a little bit. So you, you you never know, do you, how people would have gone. But, you know, yeah. I'd I like to think that it would have been great. To, I'd love to have seen someone like Graham Hick go, how he goes. Same yeah. with Mo and Ali. You know, Mo and Ali, yeah. now, he sort of epitomises what Brendan and Ben are about. Yeah. So who knows? It might get the best out of him. It might not. You know, sometimes you're ahead in life. Sometimes you're behind. Yeah. But, you know, hopefully... Yeah, well, I think, I think at, at that level, it's amazing what um, confidence does to players because... Everyone thinks that because you're playing test cricket, you're really confident and, and you're not nervous and you're you're not worried about things. But in my experience, every player at the top level needs to be told they're still going pretty well and they need confidence. And that's amazing if you give a player that what they can do. So it's it's a pretty simple recipe, really. And it looks like you guys are doing, doing that pretty well. But Dave, I remember sort of saying to you once about sort of mental toughness and stuff like that. And I remember I think you said something like you've got all the same fears and doubts as everyone else. You've just yeah. been better times at silence in them. And that's yeah. what you sort of realise, you know, and that's what your job is as a leader is to try and stop people from, don't add to that fear. Yeah, correct. Steve, Australia has changed, has has had some changes over the last year too. Mm -hmm. Justin Langer, Langer yep. yes, that's the left his role as head coach and was replaced by Andrew McDonnell. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's good. <laughs> That's right. How do you rate the Australian team over the last year and what changes has Andrew made? Yeah, well, you, you're nearly right, but I don't think Justin Langer left. Um, I, th I think he was <laughs> sort of um, given a little bit of encouragement to go, which which I found a little bit strange because I, I thought he was doing a great job. But nevertheless, Andrew McDonald, um, he's come into the t team as a coach. Uh, Pat Cummins as captain. And they're playing, I guess, in a similar way to what England does a little bit. They're very relaxed and they're saying how fantastic cricket is and how much they enjoy each other's company. And um, and they've just won that recent, well, a couple of days ago, the, the World Test Championship, so they're very confident. Um, you know, Australia's got a really, really good side. Uh, not too many weaknesses, if any. Um, and they've got a fair bit of experience now. They've got an excellent bowling attack, capable of taking 20 wickets against anyone. Um, and the batters can match it um, with most teams in the world as well. So, And we've got a really good keeper who's... I guess in the model, a little bit of Adam Gilchrist um, and Alex Carey, he's only going to get better and better. And um, you know, I think he's quite capable of batting the top six. Um, so he um, becomes an extra all-rounder in the team, looks like Cameron Green, which has given the team a new dimension. I think he's the best all-rounder Australia's produced since Keith Miller. And, um, you know, he's he could be ready for a breakout series, much in the same way as I did in 1989. Um, that was with the bat, not so much with the ball. He's capable of doing it with bat and ball and catching as well. So um, this, yeah, it shapes as a really closely matched series. And and I can't, could not say right now which team I think is going to win. I think it's that close that it's a toss of the coin and depends on key players being injured, um, maybe the toss of the coin occasionally, uh, and just whichever team gets a bit of momentum first. So Australia's got a really good team. They've got a good chance. But right now, um, I think it's 50-50. It's <laughs> Steve, England has ad adopted. adopted a more aggressive approach yep. to test cricket rec recently. recently at the Australian, what would yep. you ta tactics. tactics be to combat England's up approach. 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 Yeah, well, that's that's a good question, and that's a lot of that's a question that a lot of people are asking. You know, how um, how to tackle the way England are playing? Um, yeah, look, England have been ultra aggressive, which is great to see. Um, I think Australia will have cert their certain plans. I'm not um, in the inner sanctum anymore, but I'm sure they've got plans against specific players. I think Harry Brook is one that they would have looked at. This is a young kid that's come on and probably had the best start to test cricket that, that's ever been. Um, you know, he's going to come across some tough times at some stage. So that's, that's, that's the job for, I guess, uh, Rob Rob Key and um, 
and Ben Stokes to sort of handle when things don't go quite well because, you know, test cricket is meant to be tough and right now he's, he's making it look far too easy. He's, made, he's, he's embarrassing us all. So, um, yeah, no, no doubt he'll have some challenges going forward. But, yeah, Australia will – they'll come up with specific tactics. Um, but I don't think they'll change too much the way they're going to play. I think the key to test match cricket is to play your way and not worry so much about the opposition. And if you trust how well you're playing and what, you do, what you're doing – then generally the result takes care of itself. So, but if you're totally focused on the opposition, and you get away from your own game plan, then um, then things can go wrong. So for Australia, they'll be aware that they're up against a very aggressive English side. But I, I got a feeling the bowlers will be confident that they've got enough quality to um, to overcome that. So, yeah, you know, this is um, I think the most anticipated Ashes series probably for the last hundred years. I would have thought because no one really knows how it's going to play it, but we all know it's going to be ultra exciting. Yeah, it should be fantastic to watch. Rob, can you talk to us about the first time this new aggressive England approach was talked about? Whose idea was it, and is it something you agree with? You agreed with straight away. Here's your chance to be the. It's your, your, it was all your thinking, wasn't it? <laughs> no, exactly. That's it. I basically do, do everything. No, yeah. we. It, it was like the, the the mistake that people sort of make in the media at times is thinking that it's a tactic. You know that it, it's not actually right. We're gonna we got we got to score at five and over. We got to do this and we're gonna do that. It's more like, and it's very similar to what, again, when I was younger, what I remember asking you guys about when you said about us when you start scoring at three and a bit and over. It's like, did you tell everyone to do that? And you said, no, no, we just wanted players to express themselves and maximize their potential. So that was it, really. And then it's just sort of steamrolled a little bit. And then the media came up with the term basball, which we don't don't really like too much, because, and especially Brendan. And I think that any coach that had a, a, for, a way of playing named after him, if he liked that, then he wouldn't be a good coach for a start because his ego would get in the way. And it just... You know, it's just evolved as we go along, really. We just... Where they're really clever, Brendan and Ben, is that actually, and we spoke about it earlier, their way of giving players confidence is, is so, it's genuine and authentic is the main thing. And what they do really well, actually, is that when someone's struggling, when someone's not got any runs, when they're feeling down, that's when they're really there for them. You know, that's when they give them clarity. You keep going with that. Don't you take a backward step. What you're doing there was absolutely right. It just didn't come off on that occasion but keep committing to the way you want to play. And I think that's the key. Most people, and where those two are really good leaders, I think, most people are all right when you're winning and they're all right when someone's doing well and you're all over people when they're scoring 100. But they they do their work when you're not scoring runs. They get the person sitting quietly in the corner and get the best out of him. And that's what I think. If you want to, if people call it basball, that's what I think it is as opposed to a tactic. If I've waffled there, but that's sort of my view. Steve, Stuart Broad recently said the following about the last Ashes. <laughs> I don't class that as a real Ashes. The train facilities, the travel, the hotels, I think it's a void Ashes. What do you think the Australian team, what, what do you think the Australian team make of those comments? And is it a silly thing to say? Yeah, I thought it must have been April one, an April Fool's joke when he when he came over those comments. Um, yeah, look, I think it's um, I don't, I've never played against Stuart, but he looks a fantastic competitor and an outstanding record. And he he likes to stir things up. That's that's the way he is. That's his personality from the outside, and um, he likes to get a bit of um, I guess that going before the Test match series. That's why he motivates himself. But um, look, it was a Test match series, and um, yeah, that's all you can say. The, the result was what it was. Um, it was a real Ashes series. Um, I'm sure if England won it, we would have counted it. So, yeah, like I, I don't think they, Australia would take that worry about that comment too much or take it too seriously. It's um, it's one that the media obviously love, and um, and they jumped on the fact that he might have said that. I don't know whether he said that in jest or whether he was serious, but um, come you know ball one in the first Test match, um, those comments won't won't really matter. It's um, you know, it's when you're in the heat of the Ashes battle, um, all the talking is done, and you've got to back it up with actions. And, and that's that's going to be important in the first test match. I remember going out to Australia on that trip I went on, and and like there's all this phony war I think with Ashes cricket that because mm. everyone's got nothing to write about, 
and then, you yeah. know when the game starts they just write about the game yeah, but before sure. that everyone's just you know they they're waiting for a quote from someone because mm. it gives everyone something to write about and yeah. we landed in australia we had nasa who say my big mate who when i was 23 and he was captain he was not my big mate let me tell you mm. and he sort of he went and did the media in perth and said like the key to winning the ashes will be catching all of our catches making sure we catch everything mm. And the next day in the Western Australian, they must have waited. And all they waited in, because we were practicing, and they'd taken pictures of every drop catch in practice <laughs> all over the front pages of the newspaper. Yeah. You're like, oh, my yeah. God, this is a different world. And that's yeah. what you get all the time. Glenn McGrath used to always say he's mm. going to win 5-0. You know? Yeah, he may have said that if it was a four-test match series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're the same one every time, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Rob, there has been a big discussion heading into the Ashes series, and the biggest one was probably Jack Le Le Leach. Leach's replacement. Why did you decide on Mo Ali yeah. ahead of the other spinners? Well, I suppose, I mean, the physio for a start in my on my you know when you have people when you get messages from them and some people you're really excited to see them but when the physio sends you messages you just it's like the the harbinger of doom and the physio constantly in the lead up to the ashes all i kept getting messages from was so and so was injured ollie robinson was injured jimmy anderson was injured and you're thinking oh any i mean anyone else so anyway Fortunately, all those guys are fit and the one guy we didn't really think much about getting in, injured because he's a spinner was Jack Leach, and he'd been such a big part of our side. So anyway, unfortunately, in that Ireland game, as you say, he got injured. And then it's pretty simple cricket at times. You just then try and pick the next best. Who do you think in Ashes cricket? Who do you think is the who do you think is the next best spinner or the next best cricketer to try and win us the game in front of us? And then when we have the next game, we'll try and think who is the best player to win us that game. And you don't complicate it any more than that, really. So that's why we felt that Mo, regardless, you know, that these players now are in a world where they're playing white ball cricket, they're playing red ball cricket, you know, they're playing T20 franchise, and they have to keep swapping. And so we picked Mo because we just felt he was the best person to do the job, to be honest. We've got a few good spinners, one very young, who's Rayan Ahmed, who's really exciting. But we felt in this series that Mo would be the best. I got a question, Kizzy, and I, and I don't know where he's playing this kid, but the guy that I thought was a really good leg spinner, which he, he only had played a few times, was it Mason Crane, the Stuart Yeah, Lillard yeah, guy? from Hampshire. What, what, whatever happened to him? I mean, I thought he was uh, the real deal when I saw him in Australia. Yeah, and that was the thing a little bit. We, we, I think over the years at time, I'm not saying we get it right now, we, we judge people very quickly, especially leg spinners. We do it with the kids yeah. as well. It's like a leg spinner comes on and gets hit a little bit, and it's like, right, okay. Yeah. Go and yeah. find us some control. Find us some control. Yeah. So Mason Crane's still playing, you know, and, okay. and, and he's playing a lot of white ball cricket. He's playing a bit of red ball mm. cricket as well. Mm. But he's in that pack along with Ray and Ahmed, you know, and we yeah. felt that last year yeah. as a second spinner, mm. so our, there's, two, there's two ways that we sort of looked at things. So Ray and Ahmed last year, he's 18, bowling good leg spin, spins it both ways. And you speak to some people in England and they say, yeah, but he doesn't spin his leg spinner and he doesn't offer control and he doesn't do this. Whereas we sort of looked at him and thought, mm. on the last day of a test match and it's spinning, who do yeah. you want to bowl a side out? And yeah. it's you go down that road. But yeah. um, well, I mean, every bowl, not every, I mean, even Shane Warne rarely bowled wrong in test cricket. Yeah. He would bowl maybe one a series. So you look at, you know, one of the greatest bowlers ever, but he didn't bowl a wrong, which everybody says, oh, if you're leg spinning, you've got to bowl a wrong. Yeah. But he really needed the wrong. And so, I mean, if you've got good control over what you do, then you don't need to bowl every delivery. And you had like McGill and stuff, it wasn't, didn't have as much control as someone like Shane Warne. But you just, you see them for what they well, can yeah. do, not for what they can't. Well, that's the thing, Stu. I, I just said, look, don't worry about the runs, just take wickets. Yeah. His job was just to take wickets. And it, it didn't matter we went four or five and over, but his strike rate was unbelievable. Again, it goes back to your point. You just um, look at the positives and the strengths and just focus on that because he was never going to be a, you know, keep things tight, but you knew he could take wickets. Yeah. And that's why, you know, we, we was trying to, 
you got to sort of love your game, don't you? You know, you've got to be the best you can be rather than look. We all look at everyone else and think, oh, I wish I could do what they could do. But no, no, you've just got to love your game. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not I'm bored. I'm just tired. Sometimes I bore. Tired. Tired. That's okay. Yeah, we'll put you to sleep last night it. was not easy to sleep with. No, that's true. <laughs> it's so hot. <laughs> Steve, David or. Warner. Warner has a poor record in England. Mm -hmm. Do you think he can turn around this series and why do you think he struggles so much in England? Well, that's the question. Yeah, well, I think a lot of Australia is waiting for because he's been an outstanding player for a lot of years and he's a match winner when he's on. But uh, he had a, a poor Ashes tour last, last tour. But I know they're all great players. They want to prove themselves in di different conditions. Um, and when people think they're not going to do well, it's... It gives them more motivation. So it's a great opportunity for him. I know that Stuart Broad probably fancies his chances. Um, I know that last time, you know, he saw a weakness outside off stump around the wicket. Um, but Dave knows. The good thing is Dave knows what's coming at him. And great players tend to find a way. So that, it, it's shaping up as a pretty crucial battle at the top of the order. And we need to get off a good start. We've got um, fantastic uh, middle order players in Labuschagne and Smith. And then you've got Travis Head who's really stepped up a gear and Cameron Grant and Alex Carey, that's a really strong middle order. So if our top order can get off, off to a good start, we're in good shape. So it really is a, a crucial matchup, um, Broad versus um, Warner or whoever the English quicks are. Um, so I'm interested to see how it goes. Um, Dave needs to come up with a, a different game plan than the last Ashes, but I'm sure he's been working on something. Is he, you know, I always watch him and he always looks like he's one of those sea ball, hip ball players. You get some players that think a lot about it. I was a bit like that. You're worrying about where your hands are, your feet. Is he someone, yeah. that, is he someone that just plays on instinct or is he someone who really... He is, but he, he hits a lot of balls in the nets. I mean, these days, I mean, I was amazed when I was there four years ago that how many balls they hit. I mean, someone like Steve Smith can go for three or four hours and he'll walk out of the nets and say, I can't find my hands. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I've got to, got to stay in there till I feel good. I mean, he is very unique. Uh, but the players these days hit a lot of balls. Um, I think Dave keeps it pretty simple. He's got a really good technique. And the key to his play is that uh, when he's running between the wickets, well, he's generally batting well. So if I'm watching a test match and he takes a quick single early on, I think he's on. He's on today. When he's sharp and uh, and focused and, and, um, and switched on, that's when you know he's going to do well. And he's a confidence player. He's an eye player. Uh, and if the press reports are right that uh, the Keezy and um, and the English team want flat, hard, fast wickets, and they might, they might play into his hands. So you might have to rethink your, your tactics <laughs> on that one, mate. Just quickly ring up Edgebaston now. <laughs> we had, I remember we, I had a batting coach out in Perth who used to coach Justin Langer. Mm. Justin Langer at this stage, when I'm out there, had played 100 test matches. I think yeah. he'd, I think he'd pretty, probably maybe even retired from test cricket. And he's still playing a bit of domestic cricket. I might be wrong on that, but it's around that time. Yeah. And I said to this guy, Noddy Holder was his name. He's also a singer, but not the same one. I said, do you mind if I come and watch Justin Langham? And he said, yeah, come and have I was 26, can't remember. Yeah. And Justin Langham, I'm watching him bat. And bearing in mind, he's played. He's one of the great players. He's played 100 tests. And sometimes on the bowling machine, he's got his bat on the ground and then he'd play. Yeah. And then he'd lift his bat up in the air and then he'd play. And then he put his bat on the ground. And I'm like, Justin, why on earth do some, why does sometimes you stand with your bat on the ground and then sometimes you have it in the air? He said, because I still don't know what's the best way to go. <laughs> yeah. you played a hundred test matches. You got 20. Yeah, some, some people like overanalyzing stuff. I mean, yeah, I mean, I was the opposite. I kept it really simple, but some guys are always searching to try and get perfection. Occasionally it, it sends them mad. How you going, guys? You got any more questions? Or you? Are we, you yeah, we do. Yeah, <laughs> you more, where are we? Rob is Ben Stokes fit, and will he be bowling in the first game? Yeah, I think so. I think the thing with Ben is, like a lot of those great players, he's he's been getting ready for this moment. So everything that he's done in the IPL, in you know, in in, in Pakistan, all of that, he's. He, He's waiting for those moments where he's he's really needed. You know, it's when Harry Brooks getting runs and people like that. He's been a brilliant captain. And, 
you know, a bit like the World Cup in 2019. I, I was commentating. I watched Ben Stokes in the series before, and I'm like Ben Stokes, he, he's sort of standing at mid-on and he's not doing much. But when it really matters, and that's what you that's what great sports men and women do. When it matters, they that's when they that's when they're there. When when you need them, that's when you turn around and oh, there he is. And I think that's where Ben will be in this. Well, certainly, yeah, it might like, be for like that, mate. Every time he looks like he's injured, there's no way he's injured. He comes back and bowls twenty over straight. <laughs> he's a sort of guy that loves playing with injuries. So, is no that a bit stupid? <laughs> Sorry, it's what? is it playing when injured a bit stupid? No, it well, gives you an excuse. It's, yeah, yeah. I think when you play professional sports, sometimes you got to do that. You, you, because there's not many games where you play where you feel 100. percent So you got to learn to play through niggles. But some, some guys sort of. You think they're injured, they act like they're injured, and all of a sudden they play their best cricket. Ben Stokes is one of those, so we will better watch out for him, I think. Tell them the story about what was it? Is it the truth when you got a hundred and mm. is it the physio was ice in your leg throughout the night? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, when I got that hundred at, at the Oval, I probably shouldn't have played. I mean, I, I, I tore my calf pretty pretty badly about 18 days yeah. before that test match, and they said you're out for six months basically. It's the worst tear you can get, and you've got another tear. Actually, there's two tears. There's one at the top of your leg as well. So, um, But I just made a commitment. Oh, the physio said, look, let's try and see how we go. It's 19 days. We had physio five between five and 10 hours a day for 18 days and finally got the match. And I reckon I was probably about 50% right. But it was the last test match of the series. So I thought if I get injured, we're flying home anyway. It'll be okay. So you yeah, ended up playing the match. I probably shouldn't have played the match. And I actually tore another muscle because I was protecting the bad leg <laughs> during uh, the match. Um, then I decided, well, I was lucky. It was at the Oval, so it was a really quick ground. So you could play your shots and everything would go for four. So, um, yeah, the, I, I think a lot of players at the top level enjoy playing with a, a bit of a challenge. And sometimes an injury for a batsman is not so bad because it makes you really focus and concentrate. So you, so you should watch on YouTube, watch how he hobbles through to get his 100. Uh, yeah, I milked that, I milked that because, yeah, I was, I And then he one. just puts his bat up. At the, you got to have a watch. It's yeah. really I doubt you're much well, better, though. No, no. It depends on that. If it, I would have done that at the Oval as well because it's a flat pitch, you know, maybe not somewhere yeah. else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rob, Mo Ali hasn't played test cricket or first-class cricket for a few years. How do you think he'll cope with bowling lo longer spells and having to play five days with back-to-back -back test matches? I think he'll be fine, to be honest. He's done it. He's got that sort of muscle memory, and he'll be all right. He, you know, and he'll be he'll you know he he's like a free bet. He, he's coming back out of retirement. Yeah. He's got absolutely nothing to lose, everything to gain, and I think he'll enjoy the way that they do things. Um, so I don't think he'll worry about that at all. And neither are we. And do you know what? I'm going to be much more. I, I always like it when I, when I turn on the TV or if you're there, and I'll be much more excited watching him play. I, I, I can't wait to see him battle ball. Yeah, three more, that's okay. Yep, I'll be, yeah, but I was going to say I better wrap up shortly. I've just got to hop off somewhere. Mm -hmm. okay. Rob, Ben F Oops. Folks yep. has been left out of the Ashes squad despite playing the majority of the test matches over last year. How difficult was the DAT decision and what does he have to do to get back into the England squad? Well, it was a very difficult decision, but, you know, when you, you know, we're doing all right as a team at the moment. And often when you're doing all right as a team, then you have tough decisions to make and good players miss out. Um, so it was tough, but Johnny Bairstow, I felt, or we felt, was one of the best well, batsmen in the world last year. And also, Johnny loves keeping. That's the thing that he enjoys doing the most. Um, so it was hard. It was really hard on Ben. And what does he have to do? Well, nothing really, because he he proved that he was, you know, an excellent Test cricketer and was doing really well for us. So he's just got to be ready for when that opportunity comes, um, which could come at any time. Any time, you know, it, things happen very quickly in Test cricket. So it was a tough decision, but. You know, like Steve would, I mean, there have been so many players in that great Australian team that would have missed out, that could have played a hundred tests for another country. And that's just what yeah, happens. Yeah, it's never easy. Those decisions, always tough. Steve, there is a debate, there is a debate over wh which first bowler Australia should go with. But Boland. Boland or Hazelwood. Hazelwood. Which, 
which one would you go with and why? Yeah, look, they're both excellent bowlers. Um, I guess the thing against Josh Hazelwood, he's only played like four test matches in the last two and a bit years. So he's probably not match fit. Um, and it's hard because there's, there's no warm-up games anymore. It's basically test match after test match. So if you're not playing, it's hard to get form and it's hard to get that match fitness. Um, I think Scott Boland will play. I really like him. I think he's he'll be a leading wicket taker in the series. Um, that's that's my feel on the situation. He's um, He just knows what to do. He hits the wicket hard. He's got a really good action, repeatable. He goes all day and he just goes about his business, um, very understated. And if there's a bit in the pitch, you know, he could do really well in English conditions. So I think I'll go with Scott Boland first up, but uh, it's five test matches in six weeks. So I think all those quick bowlers will, will get an opportunity. Uh, Pat Cummins is probably the only one that will play the five. Uh, Pat Cummins and Nathan Lyon will play five tests. The other quick bowlers will, will probably share it around. Our final question. Our final few questions, and <laughs> you have to give us an answer. <laughs> Rob, you oh, no, answer coming. first, and then Steve, are you ready? I'm ready. So you want me to go first? Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Go. Who will win the Ashes, and what will be the score? Uh, don't know, but it'll be close. <laughs> right on the fence. And you, yeah, Steve? Like well, I can probably say a bit more because I'm not I'm not a media personality or, or involved in the teams. I, I think someone will win 3-2. And um, I'm an Aussie, so I've got to say Australia, but I wouldn't be surprised if England win 3-2 as well. Okay. Top run score in the Ashes. Oh, top run scorer. I will go with uh, Joe Root. There you go. Yeah, and I'll go, I think, um, Travis Head. Oh, good Top time. wicket taker in the Ashes. Top wicket taker, uh, Jimmy Anderson. He won't play five there, surely, mate. He's too old. <laughs> 48. he would be hobbling <laughs> him by the end of it. Yeah. Um, well, I said Scott Bowen will be a leading wicket taker, but he may be overtaken by Pat Cummins. Okay. We would just like to say a big thank you again to everyone who listens to our podcast. We really appreciate it. Please continue to leave reviews and pass our podcast on to your friends and family. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today, Rob and Steve. We really enjoyed speaking with you, and it means so much as a school to be able to have the opportunity to speak with you. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you. Excellent questions, guys. Really Very enjoyed it. Well done. You were much better than any of the media questions I've had so far. Exactly. So well done. You've got real careers in there. Yeah. See you guys. <laughs> oh, one See more. Bye. 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 Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Bye. Are you coming over? No, not this. Oh, he's gone. Whoops. <laughs> oh, no worries. I'll see you later. Well, can we just ask one, one quick thing, yeah. if possible? Um, yeah. We, as a podcast, we sponsor our local cricket club, uh, which is Colum, called Column Cricket Club. Colum. Yeah. Is there any yep. chance you could just say uh, good luck for the season, um, all the best, hope you do really well, keep going. Yeah, Column Cricket Club. Yeah, Column. Column? Yeah. Column. Uh, Column Cricket Club, uh, best of luck for the summer. I hope you have a really good season uh, and keep listening to the podcast, actually. It's the best one out there. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Bob. And again, best of luck for, for this series and keep doing the fantastic job you're doing. So thank you. See you all. Bye. Bye. Good seeing well you again. <laughs> well done. You're very good. Great speaking with you again. And you. See ya. Okay, have a little chat. So, what did you think about the podcast? I think it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> about the part where they said they had 20 drinks. <laughs> My favourite part was the bit where they said that one of their friends walked out with, without their clothing. Where'd they go? <laughs> He must have drank like a champagne when in an ice bath. I think a champagne would have done. I think a champagne wasn't the only thing. <laughs> what do you think? Whiskey. I know a lot. And I mean a lot. But why? I don't know. I it... hope he's he didn't walk out of the building without his clothes. I hope he didn't. <laughs>
Because if he did, I would put it on YouTube. I'm going to put it on there. And I'll be like, yo, bro. I'll be like, bro, I woke up at the wrong place and at the wrong time. But, oh, yeah. Um, thank you again for listening. Please continue to follow us on YouTube, on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. Insta. I think we have an app. Uh, what's up? No, what? Just say thank you. And thank, thank, you. thank you for listening. Bye. Bye. Ow.